Hey everyone, welcome to the comic wall. It me, the outcast angel. And today let's talk about issue 7 of Gasolina by Sean Makowitz, Nico Walter, and Matt Lopes. Alright, I was super excited about this issue. Ever since Sean Makowitz announced this series, it's really gripped my attention. Of course, I'm going to gush about the art because I, I love it. I really appreciate the art in all of these comics. And of course, all comics are art. So after last issue, which was an all Detective Arguello issue, we get to see what's going on with Randy and Amalia and with Kike. You know, since last time we found out that he has a little chest burster living in his chest. You know, it's something all growing boys go through. You know, it's, it's, it's totally natural. But now we get to see how they're dealing with all the bloodshed that went on at the farm and you know I mean it looks pretty normal you know they started with a game of Monopoly and now they're cleaning guns and loading bullets so let's go ahead and go right into it what we start off with is Amalia's trying to get Kika to eat he's he's not exactly the I guess the boy he used to be, especially, of, of course not, he has a monster living in his chest, don't we all? But the way he's drawn in these panels, he looks so terrified. His eyes are just bulging. And so Amalia's trying to get him to eat, he's just like, no. And so I'm starting to wonder if this uh, gusano, which I started calling it, which translates loosely to worm, I wonder if it's affecting his behavior, if it's controlling him in some sense. If we remember from issue 5, yeah issue 5, the gusano controlled Kike to go over to Dos Cruces, I think that's what his name was, the guy with the two crosses on his eyes. The gusano made Kike walk up to Dos Cruces and he pretty much ate him. And he even said that it it's making me move. I can't. I can't control it. So I'm wondering if this is also because uh, there's other times where he he seems completely normal. He seems completely unaffected by this. But uh, then there's other times where he, he's just like you know he has a little he has a little monster living inside him. With this being said, I wonder if this is affecting him because you know he doesn't want to eat. I'm sure he wants to eat something, just not cereal. So then Randy walks in. Uh, he was sleeping in the truck for some reason. I guess he felt more safer <laughs> sleeping outside where he didn't have to deal with this little uh, monster. And this is where we start to see that, you know, <laughs> Randy and Amalia aren't exactly built to be parents at this point in time. Because Randy and Amalia end up talking in private saying, like, just talking about this situation because of course they're not really built to be parents yet but the fact that they don't know what to do with him he's not exactly normal and it's scary I mean uh, Randy brings up that you know he saw the dead dog that we saw in issue 5 the one with the his ribs broken out and that's the thing Giga didn't do that Something broke out of him because the ribs were like broken outward. They're just trying to decide what they're going to do, especially with all the chaos that happened back on the farm. They can't exactly stay there. Los Queridos are going to be coming after them. That cartel branch that's dealing with all this supernatural stuff going on. We hear them talking, saying, we need to leave. We need to lay down. We need to lay low for a little bit. And... My dogs are barking, excuse me. They're saying, well, if we're going to leave, we need money. So, why don't we just sell all the guns that we stole from these assholes and, you know, get out of here. I'm going to knock my table over. And here's a, here's, here's a fun, fun bit. Um, while Randy is saying that he'll go to sell the guns, which it's interesting because apparently Amalia is the one who used to do that. I'm very curious as to exactly what they did before coming to uh, Veracruz because <laughs> they're not exactly sugarcane farmers, you know? That's their life now, but they obviously did some crazy shit before. Randy is saying, you know, I got this, I can do this, I'm gonna go sell the guns. And just a fun little bit, he says, you got a shopping list? And Amalia says, food and bullets. And it's like nothing else. 
And the fun bit about this is that the title, subtitle for this uh, issue is actually Gomida y Balas, which translates loosely to food and bullets. You know, just a little language lesson for y'all. So then Randy heads out to sell these guns to this guy named Chava. It's, uh, apparently these guys have history with them. And so he trusts him more to sell these, to be able to sell these guns. And so he meets this guy Chava at this, it almost looks like a pawn shop or I can't, I can't tell exactly. It doesn't ex exactly say, but you know, well, as soon as Randy walks in, Chava is talking smack. So and so we can see from here that uh, Chava has more history with Amalia than he has with Randy. He probably more acquaintances than friends with Amalia and Randy. And so you know, Randy's not taking any crap right now. He just wants to sell these guns and be done with it. And he's he's pretty good about it too because he. he negotiates the hell out of this guy. He says, I'm selling 30 guns, mostly Kalishnikovs, which are the, the Russian style machine guns. They negotiate, they're going to meet, and so it's a done deal. They got it going. All the while, while this is happening, uh, Geek and Amalia are spending some quality time together. But what we see here in the first panel is there's this hole in the bottom of, the, of their house. And while this might not seem like a big deal, it's... It's there for a reason. They wanted it to be there and to mention it for a reason because even Amalia says, that's new, gonna need to fill this in. What made that hole? Maybe the same thing that came out of the dog? Because we don't exactly know what happens or what comes out of these things of, of these people who get uh, taken over by uh, La Querida or the Saint of Death or whatever uh, Los Queridos uh, uh, wor worship. I mean, the most we see is this, that gusano that comes out of Kika's chest and that, you know, chitters every now and then. I'm curious to see what's going to happen because we don't, we still don't know what comes out of these things. And it's, I think it's going to be intense. So, so Mali and Kika are playing some football or soccer. And, you know, it turns out like a normal little game of, of soccer. But then all of a sudden we see Kika with his eyes wide open and his mouth just, his jaw just hanging open. And, you know, Amalia thinks it's, you know, he's surprised by her, her mad soccer skills. But then we see another panel where he's, he still has this expression on his face. But then we're met with this spread of what happened that night between uh, his parents and this gusano that came out of his chest. We see how exactly they died because they were pretty torn up. They were pretty torn up when Randy and Amalia first found them and we never really saw what happened. We just found out that we thought, you know, Kika was dead by whatever came out of him, but then of course he's not. And so I think he was actually having a flashback of what was going on. Maybe the gusano was giving him these flashbacks or maybe it was just remembering. It's it's hard to say exactly what's going on here because, I mean, sure, he's, he's, he has to be pretty messed up after all this. I would be traumatized. And the fact that he's taking this so well is surprising, to be honest. So after Randy meets up with uh, Chava, he goes over to Luisa, which we first got to see her in issue one. She was uh, the woman who, was, who called Amalia to come check out her daughter, which brings me to another confusing issue. When Amalia found Kike in the woods in issue four, she she's trying to comfort him and, you know, like, just calm him down. And she mentions that I have a daughter too, Graciela. And the woman's uh, daughter or the child that she's taking care of, her name's Graciela too. And so I'm wondering, is this Amalia's daughter and she's having this woman take care of her? Because even in even in uh, issue one, we see her pay this woman uh, in, well, in an envelope. And I mean, of course, we can assume there's money in there. But, you know, she has to be some kind of caretaker for her. And so I'm wondering why is she... She seems so... I don't know. She's obviously taking care of her. But and checking in on her, but she's not in her life. And so I'm curious as to, maybe she's just not ready 
she wasn't ready to have a kid. So Randy and Luisa are talking, and he's mentioning how they're going to lay low for a bit, and how uh, they're taking care of Kike, which uh, Kike is actually uh, Malia's nephew. And so, even here, we see, again, that he he's paying her again. So obviously, they have some kind of contractors or agreement going on here. And so, you know, they mention, he mentions to her that they could come with with them, but they she she's not having it. She wants to stay home, and she you know she's being stubborn, uh, stubborn Mexican mother does, doesn't want to doesn't want to leave. She wants to stay in her own home. So then we're we're thrown back to uh, Luisa, and she checks in on Graciela, who's playing in her room, and she has one of the the statues of. La Querida. I'm pretty sure that's the name of the of this death angel. And Luisa is terrified. She's like, "Where'd you get this? You're not supposed to play with this. Why didn't you tell me about this? This is this is evil. It's the work of evil men." And so she goes out to she goes outside to throw it out or destroy it. And she's noticing all throughout her neighborhood. These the statue is all over the place. It's on cars, it's on windowsills, it's on porch steps, it's everywhere. And so this isn't looking good, especially because uh, with what we saw in issue four, this cartel branch is spread out throughout town and we're starting to see exactly what's going to be the outcome of this invasion almost. So we finish up this issue with uh, Malia, you know, sitting outside, but then she sees car lights and she knows it's not Randy because because she goes inside her house locks the door and loads up her gun and then we see these men get out of this car car loaded and armed and with this woman and the first man to get out says Sylvia you sure she lives here and this woman we first Sean says we first met her in issue four and the only person I can think of is that woman who was talking smack to Randy when all the women were stuck inside and he was stuck with them and you know she was just talking mad mad smack to him she sold them out but the thing is uh, she says they're all coming with us so she's working with them now with she has to be working with uh, Los Queridas but that's the end of this issue and Things are looking bad. Fun fact, I actually got another letter uh, printed in this issue and I like to I like to read my letters uh, when I get them printed because I, I have questions myself that you guys might have as well and if um, most of y'all don't read the letters, you know, it's good to hear at least like what's getting answered exactly. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read my letter here. I start off with, hey Gasolina team, this issue was a very satisfying one. Seeing the rest of La Querida, there we go, La, La Querida, La Querida's gang wiped out, had me on the edge of my seat, and it did. It was intense. I didn't think it would be so quick, poetic nonetheless. Uh, killed by the, by the one they worship. Not to mention their leader getting killed just as brutally. I was actually hoping the gusano, I, I needed a name to call it, would eat his tattoos. Imagine my joy when it did. Also, famous last words, anyone? Perfect. Sean replies with, I didn't originally intend it to be so poetic, but I didn't always plan for Kike to be alive when that gusano, with that gusano on his chest, so there's one, there's one question answered. The original inspiration for it was a hermit crab with its ability to retract or retreat back into Kike's chest. And once the hermit crab gets too big for its shell, it, well, we'll get to it. He hinted. He hinted to something. And obviously we saw it with the dog got too big for its shell. I kind of agree with Andrew J. Shaw on this one. He's kind of the antagonist of the Skybound letter letters pages. And I say, sometimes I get a little confused with when reading an issue that has a scene taking place in the dark or in the shadows. The characters can get a little lost in the art, but at the same time, it's only when I'm not paying attention, as close attention the first time around. And when I reread the issue, I'm able to keep each character in check. The art is just, the art is just phenomenal. Also, you had, you had to kill the dog. Really, I was just admiring it in the first panel, and then I, I just about cried. And it didn't help that I, I was reading this during the slow part of my morning lecture. So, you know, it gets boring a little bit. The editor for this ser for this series, 
says, I, Ariel Basich, would never kill a dog. But Sean Makowitz, the guy's cold, real cold. Sean goes, first of all, I didn't kill the dog. Something is out there that killed that dog. I love dogs, so much so, we'll have more dogs in this comic real soon to replace the stray whose guts burst, starting next issue. Boom! Dogs! Yes! I continue with, I was just as curious about the Latino influence in this book. On my campus, there's a setup in the library where they have Latino-influenced comics and graphic novels displayed. This, seri this series deserves to be displayed along with it. So what I found out is that they have moving exhibits. They have certain exhibits laid out and then like a couple months later they'll change it and like I barely realized that they changed that same exhibit and I also saw that they were mostly displaying graphic novels that um, had writers from El Paso and so you know they were mostly displaying this type of this type of influence uh, in the Latino cu culture. So then Ariel continues with, that's great to, that your library has that set up. I certainly hope you've been checking out some Love and Rockets. Now that the Gasolina trade is out, maybe it could have a spot on that shelf. Let the library know. And I'm, I'm willing to let them know as soon as I um, get, get the volume. I haven't exactly set it up to order yet in my comic shop. So as soon as I get that down, I'll, I'll be sure to, uh, you know, try to get it in there. So then Sean ends with, we love librarians as much as we love dogs and as much as we love love and rockets, which I'm not sure what that means, what that is exactly. I'm, I'm going to check it out too because I'm, I'm a total bookworm as you can tell. Fantagraphics has made it real easy to discover the Hernandez brothers work. For Gilbert's Palomar saga, start with Heartbreak Soup. For Jaime's or Jamie's uh, continuing tale of Maggie and Hopi, check out Maggie the Mechanic. Both are filled with incredible characters and storytelling and are on my short list of favorite comics ever. So, you know, I got a lot, I got several questions answered and some answers for some questions I didn't even know to ask. And so, yeah, this is why I write in. This is right why I get excited when I get a letter printed because I get questions answered that I can't exactly ask them uh, straightforward. You know, this is as close as I can get. So, with that being said, that's the end of this issue and the end of this episode. I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, drop a like, show the love, hit that subscribe button to get more of my videos, ring the bell to get notifications of when I post new videos, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you for watching.